Right, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you for uh, giving your time to come in here and uh, all about uh, GeoBin. Hopefully the topic uh, uh, created the interest that means you're here. Uh, I'm going to give you just the slightest bit uh, about the company, who we are, and so on, and then get straight into the, uh, the important the meat and potatoes, if you will. So if you've not heard of Group BC, um, we have been around a long, long time. I know, I don't have gone enough. Um, we were one of the first uh, collaboration uh, tools. Um, we uh, uh, have always been pioneers and indeed in fact we were the first collaboration tool to really deliver the first CDE driving a level one uh, BIM project and that was the delivery of Westfield Stratford City and that was back in the uh, in, in 2006 and it was on the really the back of that, that not only did we see where the future was, but we were asked by the task group to come and help and get involved and take what we'd learned from that project and use that to drive this level two mandate that we've now uh, all got. So we continue to be members of the, uh, of the BIM uh, Tech Alliance. This is uh, a collection of, uh, uh, of vendors working for the greater good, really with the goal of just get everyone to understand why digitizing what we do is so important, the benefits that it's going to give, and uh, really just transforming uh, the industry. Um, we have a lot of organizations use our software. Uh, really, when it comes to our own clients, uh, you can see this is being divided into two. Uh, we have those who are involved in uh, delivering assets, physical assets, be these railways, be these schools, be these hospitals, uh, be these roads, um, and we also uh, have those who are involved uh, as client owner operators in actually procuring those assets. Uh, most recently, um, we have uh, uh, Sainsbury's uh, who are using us to manage their digital estate, their retail uh, platform, and so I'll show some really interesting stuff that isn't going to involve a 3D model uh, to do with them, but is absolutely about them. Um, and uh, it, so, oops. So let's get to it. So our view of BIM is quite a straightforward one, which is that this is all about the procuring of digital assets. Now, what exactly do we mean by that? Well, it's quite simple. So here is an example. Uh, it's a real example. The, uh, the building on the left is actually uh, something known as the E4 home, uh, which one of our customers, Wienerberger, who are here, um, has been innovating around, which is really the home for the future in terms of uh, integrating with supply, supplier information, sensors, all kinds of things. But the idea here is that whereas in the past we would uh, procure as a client or deliver as someone involved in asset delivery, uh, a physical asset, and then as far as the information that would go with that, it would be a mixture of drawings and spreadsheets and maybe some models and so on, but it would generally be unstructured to the point of requiring a lot of time to actually make any sense out of it and to get into operations. The whole thing we're trying to do here is when we deliver this physical asset, parallel we deliver a digital asset. So this is not just what does something look like in terms of its geometry, but this is all of the associated data that's going to allow you to make decisions through the life cycle down to something as simple as a customer being able to define and choose paint colour, uh, know exactly what it's going to come from, what paint and so on in this example here. Um, and on the right hand side through to the delivery of the digital asset with um, all of the associated documentation as well. So the example I always give, and this is our future vision, when we get to this point, someone who's got uh, a washing machine, for example, uh, that they have a problem with in this, in this house, um, they'll be in a position whereby if it goes wrong, sometime in the future, their phone will simply say, there was a problem with that, we know what the problem was, an engineer's coming in two days time. We can only deliver that kind of future if we start to automate and digitize what we're doing here. And it's not just buildings. I mentioned this before. So we've got, we've got buildings, of course, but we've got linear assets. So here you can see a point cloud of a road and then models uh, being superimposed of there. <coughs> and then at the bottom there, we have a flood alleviation uh, project, uh, which is Counters Creek, uh, London Thames Water are one of our clients, and they uh, have uh, um, modeled that with about 14 models coming together. Um, so, and it's not 
just new builds either. This is really interesting as far as I'm concerned, because if we want to see where we are and where we could be, we recently had a couple of school students come and spend a week with us, and we gave them a simple challenge, and that challenge was, can you digitize our office? So this is an office space, and this produced in SketchUp, and then taking the fit-out information as we had it at the time and extruding it and so on, and then going around and attaching uh, data points that connect to information about the assets in there. That was produced by two school students, and they absolutely saw how this was a no-brainer. So hopefully we can all learn from that, and we, we mustn't think we've got to wait until uh, we, we delivered these models to take benefit of it. We have and there's a project I can talk about uh, here, um, uh, the Sainsbury's, where without a single uh, 3D model, we've managed to digitize their estate. Because what they've got is they've got all of their existing information about their estate in drawings. And it used to be that those drawings were on a, on a file share, uh, and now those drawings are in a database. Or rather, the data within those drawings is in a database and queryable across the estate by anyone using this system. So the structured data um, will allow us, uh, through technology, to open this up to people who previously didn't have access to this information and the decision-making process uh, took a long time. So this uh, includes drawings. So, so far, we've said that digital assets are, in some form, geometry or spatial information, the same as one being spatial information, structured data, and associated documentation. So if we look at an example of that, what can we do with that? Well, we can, we can federate, we can take a, uh, an architectural model, an MEP model, and a structure, and we can put it in a browser, and we can look around it, and we can do nice things with it. Um, and we can also, within that browser, we can even do things like clash it. We can look where there's physical interactions in the model um, and then uh, enact upon those. Um, and importantly, these, these aren't tools simply for viewing, walking around, looking for clashes. We are, as I said at the start, this is all about how can we make digital assets? How can we build up from what starts like an outline design into something that mimics what we've got in as built? And this means not only do we have to uh, have, have the geometry, we have to have all the documentation. So if we can uh, take a model, we can find, for example, all the smoke detectors as we've got in this building, and then immediately associate that with the appropriate documentation, um, then we're getting some way to that, and data. So we're now in the position whereby we can attach documents, we can attach data, we can even take data straight from supplier data templates. I was talking about that earlier in terms of data validation with Paul Surin and Nick Tune, which is, which is fantastic, because what that then allows us to do is have this rich data model and I can, I can export it and I can analyze it and I can make decisions more quickly on the basis of that that previously I would have had to look at various drawings and spreadsheets and so on. I've said what I want and I've then captured it and I can use that to make decisions. But, and this talk is called GeoBoom for a reason, there are a number of questions with all of that information that I'm still not able to answer. So with that information that tells me what it looks like, what the properties are, what the documentation is, how would I be able to answer, is it in the right place? So is, it, is the building actually digitally going to be located in the right place? And even if it is in the right dot, what about orientation? Because if it's built at the wrong angle, all kinds of things can go on there. And of course, what will it look like with other buildings? So a term that was coined by our colleagues at the OS and I rather like is that when we talk about BIM and we can talk about digital assets at the moment, the word is splendid isolation. So we have this fantastically rich model, but it lacks any kind of context that then allows us to answer the questions that I just did. So GeoBIM is about taking BIM and connecting it with other data, particularly with geospatial information and with other linked data sets. So if we just then look at these examples, now we have that same model, but now it's overlaid with high quality mapping data from the Ordnance Survey. 
So I now, in fact, don't have to go out and say, right, we're embarking on this project, let's go out and resurvey. I can know I can get in highly current information and see exactly what it's going to be like in that, in that planning stage. I can also um, see how it sits by bringing in the elevations of other buildings. So, in fact, the Counters Creek example that I mentioned earlier, uh, the alleviation scheme, there are a number of suppliers involved in providing models for that particular project. I won't name names, but one of the models that came in was a model of all of the surrounding elevations of the buildings, and it was wrong. It was oriented incorrectly and it didn't even have the correct information. The correct information was in fact immediately available in the OS data and all that we needed to do was find a way to bring that two information sets together. And this is the power of being able to take BIM and Geo information. Similarly, I'm inside the building um, and given that I can see these elevations, this, I can say, well, what's it actually going to look like for people in there? Are there going to be places where all of the light is cut out and so on and so forth. So I'm not just looking from inside out to avoid, I'm looking from inside out to what already exists for a close representation of it. And of course, is this location actually viable? So I can look from on top um, and I can also look at it from a point of view of any site logistics. How am I going to be able to actually uh, uh, carry out uh, the operation in terms of roads and so on and so forth. So that is a good summary of what we're trying to do with GeoBIM. Now, clearly not everyone yet has rich models of their entire estate, but that doesn't mean that there isn't an awful lot that can be done by connecting um, the information that we do have with geospatial information and other data sets now. So, as I said, it's a very, very clear proposition. We've got customers who have lots and lots of assets and their overall goal, just like Sainsbury's, is digitizing their entire estate so that they can make quicker and better decisions. Um, and so what we found initially, even at the simplest level, is if we can geolocate those assets on, on a map, suddenly the level of engagement that we get from parties within the client, particularly those in operations, who previously have really, as we all know from listening to conversations, it's been difficult to get engagement. The moment you see something that tangibly goes, okay, I can see where all my assets are and I can just pick and I can go to them, it, it, it's a game changer. Um, but not only that, this isn't just about visualization and the equivalent of Google Maps. This is about if I can then take that information and uh, that, that, that mapping, but overlay it with other data sets that are in entirely different locations and I would have to go through different exercises to do, but instead can just bring them into one place, then suddenly I can think of a question, as long as there are data sets to support it, then in theory, I'm in a position to be able to answer it. So you can see here, I hope, this is the actual Thames water system, we have little points within this system, and those reflect um, assets, projects that uh, Thames Water Capital Delivery have, which used to be that the interface to that was a folder structure, or a word search, or something like that, which is, which is great, and if well structured, um, is, is very easy to find information, but not as easy as, here's a map, zoom into where I'm interested in, find the projects and go. And also at the same time, tell me all of the other context of projects so that if I'm someone carrying out operations, not only can I get the relevant information before I go, but I can optimize uh, my actual work as well. And so if we are zoomed in here, we can see that this is, as I say, the current information. We're, we're, this is streamed directly from Ordnance Survey and overlaid with the data that we've got within what we would call a common data environment, be it that that's in drawings, be it that that's in models. So this is about overlaying that rich information. And then you can, of course, filter out and look for the things um, that you're interested in. And as I say, the instant access to other data sets. So if I want to find address information, routes, uh, boundary lines, local authority boundary lines with regards to <coughs> the works that I'm carrying out, tree preservations and so on. If you think about all these mini exercises that go on 
in order to try and determine throughout the stages uh, whether or not you're able to uh, continue the work as is or whether you need to make changes. If instead of having to have these mini projects and have information come from others, you were at your fingertips able simply to bring in that information and see it, um, then we can bring in real efficiencies with this. Um, so a real example here as well is even forgetting the externally available data sets, of which there are hundreds, you just have to go to data.gov.uk, where under freedom of information an enormous amount of data is being published, um, which if capitalised upon can, can drive real efficiencies. There's also the customer's own data set. So one of the things that Thames are looking at is can they link their assets and the delivery of to the customer complaints that they've got. And if they can do that, they can understand what's driving those customer complaints and how to do things better. But while those things are separate, how are they going to do that? So, and uh, here you can see an example where we've simply taken that mapping that I showed and we've overlaid uh, flood uh, information uh, that's really just to show that this stuff is, is eminently doable uh, now. Um, but you can also uh, have data sets, as I say, around ownership, around sites of scientific interest. Uh, the, 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 the possibilities are, as I hope you can see in the short time, uh, endless. And coming back to Sainsbury's, this isn't then about having the ability to just look at assets in isolation, single assets. This is about being able to digitize an estate and then being able to um, query that estate. So that if I, for example, want to find against what is the current specification, um, find all the pizza counters I have uh, across the estate and find out which ones don't meet the current estate without having to bury through a whole load of drawings, without having to do that, then by digitizing that estate, we're able simply to return that as tabular information and then act on it by creating the necessary programs and so on and so forth. Um, and I'm just going to give you a glimpse uh, into, the, uh, uh, into the future as well. So where this is all leading to, and ultimately, a number of years ago when I was telling people about BIM, I would say, you know, what are we trying to do here? Why is it so important? to codify everything. It's because we're not focusing on getting an improvement from one project. Um, ultimately, that's, that's not the lofty goal. If we can adhere to these standards, if we can all do things the same way, then we can have the same information about certainly our public projects nationally. So we can have something which we might refer to more like city BIM. And as a result, if something goes wrong in one of our buildings, we can look across the entire estate and we can identify uh, any challenges and so on. Um, but City BIM, certainly if we're going to uh, want to be able to browse and flow through and, and see these rich models, which uh, try as we might, are getting populated with more and more and more complex geometry, um, then technology is going to have to keep uh, going. and. Uh, um, you know, the, the power of everything I've shown here, you might think, well, I can do some of this with Esri, or I could do that. Remember, this is all being streamed through a web browser. It's all connected to our information management systems, and it's all part of one flowing life cycle. And GeoBIM is about doing that same thing, but across uh, an entire national estate with it connected to data sets and so on. So just... Um, to give you a final. So this is just something we've been working on. Forgive me for being a bit showy. Um, but you'll have seen BIM viewers before. Um, there's about half a billion polygons uh, being shown here, which is a massive, massive, massive. Each of these models is about 14 federated models that you would struggle to run usually in a single browser with a lot of the tools out here. But we've been working incredibly hard based on obviously you know, streaming it and, and, and getting more detail as you get closer, to be able to say you can throw as many models as you like into this estate, but ultimately you're going to be able to get to um, the uh, areas of interest as and when um, you, you get to the building in question. So these aren't just block models, these are rich IFC models, and this technology is constantly moving to achieve the goal um, that I talked about. So. There was a lot to whistle to go through, but hopefully that's raised some ideas and, uh, and uh, has, has been interesting for you. So uh, I will uh, 
I will stop there because I think you've pulled to two. So, any questions? Sorry. How do we want? Sorry. The, 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 the product itself is, uh, well, I mean, you can talk to my colleagues over there, it's probably because there's, I think, someone waiting to give a talk, um, but basically uh, it's, it's modular and you take the bits you want, but yes, the client typically uh, buys a number of licenses for users and then they can use it across their entire estate. It's not project-based, it's buy a set of licenses and then you can have, because if you're managing an estate, you need to have them, so, yeah. Okay? Thank you all, thank you.